So uh, let me just briefly introduce you by name and affiliation, and then uh, I'll allow you each to kind of go and give kind of a deeper kind of kind of uh, intro. But Tracy Reagan uh, from Deploy Hub, Raul Akakula from J.P. Morgan Chase, and Bob Calloway from Google. All three of them are folks who are deeply, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, involved with. OpenSSF uh, with the governance. Uh, Tracy uh, and Rao are both on the OpenSSF governing board, and Bob is the chair of the Technical Advisory Council. So thought it'd be kind of interesting to put together kind of a closing panel, uh, again, looking at how do we help business understand the impact of what we're doing? How do we help make the case for this kind of internally uh, 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 in our own organizations? Uh, and security is one of those things that companies sometimes get a little rivalrous about. We would love our customers to believe that we're more secure than the competition. Right, uh, uh, either directly or, or indirectly. Yet, working in open SSF kind of is about sharing that as a first order principle. So, um, uh, why don't we just kind of go down? Uh, and, and I've got a few questions for, for for my panelists to start, but then we'll kind of open it up to, to broader conversation. So, why don't I start with Rao? Um, could you tell us more about the role you play in JPMC and kind of what led you to open SSF? Yeah, I'm Rao Lakakula, I'm the head of product security in JP Morgan Chase. After working uh, in startups and technology companies for 20 years, I thought it's fun to work in a bank, so I joined <laughs> JP Morgan Chase three years back, um, expecting like a bunch of uh, guys wearing suit and running around and developers in the back like working in a dungeon, but actually it's opposite. I'll talk more about it. We actually, it's actually a tech shop with a bank face on it, so it's interesting. Um, so with, uh, with the open SSF, I mean, as uh, Brand mentioned I'm serving on the governing board now. I've been doing that from 2020, from the inception. Before that, I was part of the governing board for the Open Source Security Coalition, which is merged into the OpenSSF. I served on TAC, uh, Bob is serving now, but I was on the TAC last year. So I have relationship with OpenSSF. JPMC been the, from the beginning, uh, big supporter of OpenSSF, and we are a premium member now. Great, thank you. Um, let's go to Tracy next. Tracy, uh, as representing to some degree the kind of the startup ecosystem in, in this world of what are otherwise kind of the big monster players in the, in, in the tech industry, um, tell us more about Deploy Hub. Tell us more also about what kind of led you to participate and join OpenSSF. So uh, my background is a, comes from the build space. Um, I cut my teeth in, on Wall Street in software development uh, and moved into uh, insurance and finally went to work for Discover Card, Discover Financial. And in all those cases, they always ask for what we now call an S-bomb. And in 1995, my partner and I created a company called Open Make Software that really leveraged the build process and locked it down really tight. We sold that to what, what is now Broadcom, and that product has, has been around now for 27 years, still pays the bills. Um, but now we saw a shift coming with microservices and said, how do we reimagine that and how do we start tracking S-bombs from that perspective when you have lots of S-bombs and no way to aggregate them up to the application level? So when I saw the OpenSSF start uh, to shine, I was like, oh, they're my peeps. <laughs> Finally, I can talk to somebody about S-bombs. And I can't tell you, I literally feel like I've been waiting most of my career to be part of this community because we were on a very, I always used to tell people, we're like a furniture store on the very end of a dead end street with no lights. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to come down there and talk to you about S-bombs, but now we're talking about it and I couldn't be more excited. Also it helps to have a White House executive order. It really helps to have and... a White House executive <laughs> order. It's like, finally. <laughs> right. um, and Bob, let's go to you. Um, Google's investments in, in open source security are legion now, you know, kind of well known. Um, but why, why is that? Why, uh, I mean, uh, Google's a big contributor to open source in general, but, but this seems to have ri risen in importance very recently. Uh, and uh, um, could you tell us just more? I mean, Google has made such a, a massive commitment to it. Um, I, 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 yeah, just help, help us understand a bit more deeply kind of your role perhaps in that and, and, yeah. and Google's priorities. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm a, uh... Bob with Google, a tech lead and manager of Google's open source security team. And our team is 100% focused on working on the same fundamental mission of the OpenSSF to make upstream more secure. Um, you know, in terms of your specific question as to why, I would point to, I mean, everybody knows what Google is and the role that it plays in, in people's lives. 
that's given the company a very unique perspective to not only the, the scale of uh, the challenges that are out there, but also to the breadth of uh, different open source communities and practices uh, that are being adopted. And so at Google, we have the, 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 you know, the blessing of being able to employ over you know, tens of thousands of people that work upstream every single day. And so it's, it's that richness and that almost community dynamic that gives us you know, the almost informed opinion to say, like, look, there is a lot of opportunity to make things a lot better. And so coming back to kind of our, our corporate you know, rallying cry or motto of you know, do the right thing, but do the right thing for the user, when you look at that space and you look at the places where you're working day in and day out, you have that moral obligation in some sense to, to give back and do better. And so when we saw kind of the, the formation of the OpenSSF, we said, you know what, this is a really unique opportunity where we're seeing all of the massive players come together. We need to play a leadership role in that. But so for us, the, the business case behind that is, again, like not so much in that, yeah, there's a ton of problems, but if we look at where our customers are going, even if we had a magic wand and cured all of the vulnerabilities and all the issues today, Projects are still going to be created tonight that may have issues going forward. So it's about really making sure that we're solving the problem sustainably in the long term. And so we realize that that sustainable approach needs a structural, you know, its own unique structural uh, kind of mission above and beyond just going and trying to clean up everything that exists right now. But isn't somebody between you and Sunder <laughs> say at some point, you're like, this is costing too much. How do we justify this to shareholders? Like, like no? No, I don't, I don't think okay. so at all. I mean. Um, you know, again, it goes back to the breadth of the use cases that we uh, see on a regular basis. It goes to, you know, security is the cornerstone of our, our, port, you know, our product and, and go-to-market strategy in terms yeah. of where we see our differentiation. So there's benefits to us as a corporation that are very clear, but it's also going back to that notion of what do we do, the, how do we do right by the customer and do right by the broader user of all of our services. For us to take a leadership role, the, the business case and the, the justification is very clear all the way up and down the management chain. Rao, I'm sure there's somebody between you and Jamie Dimon. Uh, Jamie Diamond's here, CEO, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, so there's there's got to be somebody. Well, he hates Bitcoin. He, he was ahead of the curve on that. Uh, it was really good. Um, uh, there's got to be somebody between you and him who's pushing back, who's going, why why make this investment? Why 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 jump in? We're consumers of this technology, aren't we? I, it's actually I got surprised. I was actually expecting that, but I think part of it is we're heavily regulated industry. Compliance and security have been pri highly prioritized, actually. So most of the time, it, the business is supportive of the security initiatives. So that's what actually made my life easier <laughs> to support OpenSSF is actually all the way up to the Lori Beer, who is our global CIO, and Jamie Diamond, they're fully supportive of OpenSSF. That's great. So yeah, I mean, it, it, do you expect that? But I think uh, probably thanks to regulators, but actually security is considered as very important. Yeah, again, it helps to have the White House beating a drum. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. uh, but there's something that regulated industries, like especially banks, have to follow, which is the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? Does that play a role in justifying this work It at all, does, it? and also regulators also getting smarter and asking the right questions, too. I think it's help, definitely helping. And obviously, log for shell and <laughs> solar winds definitely help to make the case, right? Yeah. But I think overall, the trend has been changing. I mean, it... Rather than, I mean, log for shell is a good example. I seen the business execute asking the right questions about earlier, I think a few years back, the knee jerk reaction would be, let's stop using log for j and let's build something inside, right? But actually now they're asking like, hey, let's, let's actually understand more about how do we help the open source community to do better? Where else we could actually understand the critical uh, software we are using, how do we help them community wise? So I think the, the trend is kind of changing and more being transparency, supportive, rather than blame, blaming earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. For an organization who knows how to price risk to, to five decimal points, though, <laughs> I imagine um, some, of the, some of the better statistics, some of the metrics that we've talked about to evaluate the trustworthiness of code would be helpful in making that case, too, right? Certainly, we do that, right? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we do actually have 53,000 developers now. You have what? 53,000 developers in JP Morgan Chase. Which is actually a surprise to me when I joined. I, would, I didn't expect that number. That was actually 35,000 when I joined three years back. Now we've grown to 53,000. So as you can imagine, 53,000 developers developing applications, and most of applications these days have 80 to 90 percent open source software. That means we're actually using. You're not a bank. You're a software company that deals with other people's money from time <laughs> exactly, to time. Exactly right. <laughs> so half a million open source packages are out there for developers to use. So we do actually churn a lot of code, including open source. 
So we do actually have security controls and automated mechanisms to look for security vulnerabilities, making sure the right software get into the bank, and also continuously looking for vulnerabilities in, in the process, like every day, right? So there we do have those mechanisms, and that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. And Tracy, same kind of question to you, but it's obviously at a different scale. Like, how, how do you make the case to customers or even to like your own internal stakeholders about the investments you make in stuff that just goes back out and could be so easily picked up by your competitors and, and, uh, and used to compete against you? So I, I think that... Um, Is her mic point, working? Yeah. Okay. The point about being a, uh, accountable to your customers. It's not, it's not I don't think it's working, sorry. Uh, we'll just get... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, why don't we just get the handheld mic up here? Yep. I'll run and get it. Oh, you know, I think the battery went dead because it was, had a light on and now it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's just the battery on. It's there the you problem go. with end of the day sessions. Yeah. <laughs> Figures. So I think being accountable to your customers uh, is primary, but we're in the business of doing security. So. Uh, you know, we're in the business of, right now, where Deploy Hub tracks, um, it's, a, it's a catalog that tracks your supply chain and who's using it. So if we're not, if we're not doing the right thing, we can't expect our customers to be doing the right thing. So in our world, it's leading by example. That is where we see um, the reasons why we, we participate in these kinds of organizations, as well as spend a lot of time worrying about vulnerabilities and scanning our own <laughs> code and eating our own dog food. Well, the three of you are either lead or are lucky enough to work for rather forward-leaning organizations. Um, on this topic, though, I imagine there's folks out there working for orgs where you're kind of here on the sly, uh, or, or you know, kind of because you believe in the importance of it, but uh, finding carving out the time to be able to commit to it might be a bit of a challenge. Um, what are, what's some advice that some of you might offer to, to them in helping make the case up the, up the management chain to, to be able to spend more of their time on these topics uh, and, and engaging with, uh, with the public community? Like for, for organizations run not by, by less enlightened individuals. <laughs> they, they always say, follow the money. <laughs> follow the money. Yeah, I would say, um, I think for any size company, startups too, like a big bank like JPMC, Innovation is the key to move forward, right? Innovate faster, like innovate faster, actually open source is the key in my opinion, right? Like you don't want to like reinvent the wheel. So if you think that way, innovation faster, open source is feeding that, and then security is the key to actually enable the technology securely so that we keep the customer trust intact. So I think if you think that way, no one actually is opposite to innovation. Like all the business wanted to is enable the innovation, move faster, deliver value to the customer faster. I think making a case that way, I think makes it easy. So I think we just have to tie that back and educate the business people about how the open source is securely making their innovation go faster. Yeah, I think the dynamic I would highlight there is it's also about open source gives you an opportunity to learn from peers around what's good and what's bad. Um, and being able to take that back to drive that innovation engine. I mean, in, in my old jobs before this, you know, I often talked to customers and you know, was seeing a trend towards you know, the, the overall release pipeline and supply chain is really a core part of a company's intellectual property, not just from a risk perspective and that they need to do it right. It's how they engage with their developers. It's about the cadence upon which they work. And so you know, talking about the, the learnings that you get from engaging in the community here helps to really serve that, that core innovation engine or just the core infrastructure there. It helps you personally to help develop your skills and learn from others. It also helps the company really position themselves to attract the best talent and go after the market opportunities that they have. So it, it's in some sense, you can look at it very short-sighted and say, yeah, there's some security problems and maybe these are projects that we use. But if you actually start to lean into that diversity in a meaningful way, you can actually make your, your internal systems and your own career um, you know, pay off dividends uh, in ways that maybe you never thought of before. So it's, I think, about playing the longer game and really appreciating that there's a lot of insight and learnings that come to uh, benefit all of us by engaging in upstream. Yeah, you know, in the early days of open source, uh, we kept trying to come up with ways to justify companies, you know, spending time and, and money on this. And uh, one of the quotes that helped us came from a, a Sun co-founder named Bill Joy, who said, you know, most smart people in the world don't work for you. 
uh, uh, you know, <laughs> there are more people outside of your own organization you know, that, who might be helpful uh, to common cause that you might have with them than you could possibly muster. Well, maybe JP Morgan has enough people inside. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but my sense is, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but my sense is that people are realizing now that uh, in the field of cybersecurity, it no longer is enough to just buy grade, you know, point tools off the shelf and, and, and have a bunch of internal controls, that there is much more of a it takes a village kind of thing. There's much greater interdependence, even between potentially competitors, to try to close some of these issues. Is that, do you guys see that too? Is there an example of that? Absolutely. I mean, okay. if you look at the dependency graph for Kubernetes, it's one of the famous images you're probably going to see all week long in, in talks, right? It's a mess. It's an intertribe web of all of these things. And, and so even if you solve one key point, like, okay, there's still 100 more to go after that, right? So it, it begs the question, what are the patterns, what are the systemic approaches that we can solve, uh, that we can use as, a, as approaches to solve the problem? And in doing so, it's about sampling the community. So I think it's absolutely true. Um, is that, is that why um, Google open sourced uh, Salsa and brought it, and brought it to the community? Because it started life, if I remember correctly, as, as Google's internal kind of DevSecOps pipeline tool right, to manage yeah, the, it, it the comes risk from, around deployments. Yeah, it comes from our internal systems running on Borg, which is kind of the predecessor to Kubernetes, uh, something called BCID. Um, but it, it was really about, hey, if we understand how to apply that within our own infrastructure, um, that's great. But if you look out there for the broader open recommendations around best practices, how to do this, there really, there were point things here and there, but there really wasn't a single place to actually talk about, you know, for you know, verifying the integrity of source all the way through the pipeline to get to prod, what are the best practices, and leave it in an in a implementation and tool agnostic way. So just literally saying what are the right things to ultimately do. And so I think what we've done with Salsa is not only just say what it looks like, but we're actually helping people to answer that in the environments where they really are. So go where the projects are. If they're running on top of GitHub Actions or they're going you know, on top of GitLab or other CI infrastructure, how can they ultimately take where they are today and implement one, of the, one or more of those best practices uh, and make it actionable? Uh, that's where we've seen a lot of the, the engagement around that community. Not just like, hey, let's all tell people what to do. There's plenty of people up pontificating about what, what good looks like. Help them get there is really where we're trying to take the Salsa community going forward. But yeah, it, it does come from our own learnings of building out our own web scale infrastructure on, on the Google side. Yeah. Anything else either you want to add on that? Well, I, I would say when I first saw Salsa and started you know, reading, I realized that we finally started looking at our new door metrics, to be quite honest. <laughs> Um, I always tell people, if door, the door metrics, we can still use them and they're still important, but they may be getting a little bit long in the tooth, and I think Salsa really helps us uh, pivot a bit from that. So if you've not read them and not understand what those basic principles are, I would highly recommend you do that and combine them with your door metrics. So um, one of the things that's different about OpenSSF compared to other typical Linux Foundation projects is we're not just about writing some code and shipping it, right? Uh, uh, or even, you know, uh, lots of different hundreds of pieces of code. We're also about education materials. We're also about uh, uh, specifications like Salsa and tooling to support that. Um, uh, but also we're looking at a, a number of projects that lend themselves to a little bit more like the, what Let's Encrypt does, which is another Linux Foundation project. It's very much a, a service rather than a piece of software that has kind of commoditized the, the TLS certificate space, right? Um, and there's, there's kind of some active questions in the community about are there other kinds of information services or other kinds of uh, uh, systems that perhaps started life as something that a company built as a, as a, comp a proprietary thing that it's about time for that to potentially become community managed or community governed. Um, and I don't know if um, either of you have kind of thoughts on this, but uh, are, there, are, there the, are there services in the cybersecurity space or kind of things that should become public resources the way Let's Encrypt has, and if so, what are some of the things that you think we should be looking at in the open SSF community on that front? Well, again, I come from the, really, I, my head is so into compiling, linking code and putting the pieces together. And then from an open source perspective, we've really built this massive Death Star with all these interdependencies, and now we've got to clean it up and sort it out. But when I, you know, if we could talk about AI just for just a minute, um, there are these foundational models that are starting to come out that's going to be generating code. Uh, like M Microsoft has Copilot. I feel like th that is something that the OpenSSF at least should be having a conversation about because what if we have something bad in that, right? And everybody's generating code based off of Copilot. 
So, and th that's not going to be the only foundational model that's out there. There are a lot of uh, AI companies that are really pushing to build these foundation models and what's in them and who's using them. And as soon as we start consuming them, if we have 53,000 people at JP Morgan alone, and as Jamie pointed out, education's important, um, bringing in new collar workers, I can promise you that they're going to be using these foundation models to, to create code. So I would say that's an area that the open SSF should be looking at. Okay. Yeah, I think two spaces come to mind. One is around, um, you know, the six door project yeah. certainly is maybe the, the trigger for the question, but, you know, looking at how Let's Encrypt fundamentally disrupted the, the TLS market, not, not really of like, hey, we're now gonna give something away for free, but there was this underserved market of people that just said, hey, look, it's too difficult to go get a certificate. And arguably like, okay, it wasn't super difficult to get one, but to keep it up to date and to understand the life cycle of what that looked like, that was daunting. So if you look at what was done there, I think this, what the Sigsor project has done around code signing certificates, there's a strong analogy to really redu removing as much of the friction as absolutely possible to A, get a certificate, but then managing the key uh, material that's behind that and removing as much of the, that friction as possible. Again, not trying to position that that is one model that everybody must use. It is an, an option uh, and that the Sigsor project aims to be very open and modular uh, to, to adapt to different folks because people, let's, let's be honest, Banks are still going to own HSMs. Companies are still going to have hardware keys. Those, those are not going away anytime soon. So I think that's an opportunity, though, for just you know us to say, what are those underserved segments of the open source developer population, and are there better ways that we can reach them? And I think Sixor is one example of that. Yeah, um, and Sixor is a great example of something that's part software, like just regular open service. source code, and yeah. certainly part service that right. today is kind of, I don't know, is it under Luke Hines' desk, the, the main uh, kind of <laughs> oh. uh, uh, yeah. Sixor uh, key it, issuer uh, no, server? It's, okay. it's, it's, it's running, in a colo somewhere. It's, it's but, running in GCP with our, our, okay. our world-class services, so we're, I think we're good on that front. Okay. Um, that being said, I think the other example being uh, the OSV project, right? So you mm. take, hey, we've got vulnerability information from many different vendors out there, of different levels of fidelity, depending on what project you're talking about. We said, look, how can we normalize this and define a common schema to answer very simple questions about, I have open source package X, what vulnerabilities exist in that package? And having just a very simple canonical way to answer that question. So we, we, within the OpenSSF created that, but again, a schema does no good if there's not actually a service behind it to give you that information. So the OSV API that we've launched uh, you know, aggregates all of those different sources that are out there and uh, from the package managers, from different vulnerability databases and makes that very easy to, for folks to consume. And we're now seeing adoption come full circle within Python tooling. So we have now something called pip audit, which will at deploy time run and tell you, hey, wait, is the thing you're about to install, does it have any critical vulnerabilities that you should maybe think twice about before you pull this onto your system? So we're starting to see these notions of public good services come out that are either you know, serving segments of the developer population that were perhaps underserved or answering questions that were just unanswered in the past uh, due to various levels of friction or, or barriers that, that you know, may exist for some valid reason, um, but it's preventing people from getting the information they need to make sane decisions at, at, at the right time. I think in my opinion, actually, Few years back, the automated tools to detect the vulnerabilities were actually proprietary. Over the years, I think mm -hmm. most of them are actually free for public uh, open source package. That's a great thing. But still, I think the fundamental problem is we still have a ton of tools finding issues. We're still lacking the tools to help the developer and maintainers to fix the issues, right? So I actually would like to see more. I mean, there are some research happened, like open rewrite. There's a but I would like to see more of like maybe OpenSS of taking on that programmatically fix, uh, provide the remediation fixes to help the maintainers. I think the post. biggest challenge there is uh, dealing with false positives. And somebody has proposed, I forget which, in, with, which, uh, which working group this is within, but I uh, uh, proposed uh, an AI model to try to help weed out the false negatives from uh, uh, reports back from automated scanning tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, if it's really the right kind of tool for the job, but it's, at worth, it's worth at least trying to figure out, can we get better at that? Because that's the main reason open source developers haven't used these kinds of scanning tools, is there's so much noise that comes out from them that it sometimes feels like it's not worth it. But uh, I think we can change that. Yeah, I think that uh, if we asked most people still 
turn off warnings when they compile their code. <laughs> so, and I think accessibility of the information, it becomes problematic as well, because you think about it, you generate an SBOM, for example, and it's, in a, and it's in a text file sitting somewhere where you generated it. Where is it? Did, did you version it? You know, and then you've got to map that out to get your vulnerability. So if we're not creating a way to make this easy and developers have enough on their plate, it's really hard to expect them to take advantage of the information if it's not in their face. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of that in so many ways. It's like, I don't want to have to go dig for the information. I want it served to me. So I know that we have SBOMs everywhere is one of the projects and I'm working on that. And I think that that is going to be a primary area to have SBOM information and the vulnerability information available to everyone uh, and make it easy to find, not go, where's the build and I gotta go find that. And now where's the vulnerability report and I need to go find that. It just, it's, it's hard. It's, there's a lot of pieces and parts and it's hard. I think I mentioned I wasn't a very good programmer, and one of those was I hated all those warnings about my void stars being used as a float uh, in the code. Like I just I didn't want to see that, uh, and well, I maybe should have paid more attention. Well, memory is really required. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably should have paid more attention, or just use a modern language that is type safe, anyways. Well, right? you think about where we really started. It was it, at least where we started in trying to come up with why we needed a build audit report is because we were trying to solve the question why. Why does it work on that machine, but not on this machine? And if you had a clean build audit, all the way down to what the machine looked like, you could do a, dif a difference report and clearly see, again, going back to accessibility of the information. How accessible is the information and how, how can we act on it? Neutrinos, though. Bit flips and memory. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, cool. Well, uh, I think we'll have time for one or two questions. And this can really be open-ended about, like, what folks think about the future of OpenSSF or things that we could be doing or things that are going on now you might not know, know much about. But let me just ask one fun question before we open it up. What is the, the most unsung hero in the um, OpenSSF circus? Like, the project that you guys uh, think should have a whole lot more attention uh, paid to it? Or, or, uh, Alpha somewhere? Omega. Alpha Omega, okay, great. Uh, Rob? I think OpenCRE.com and requirements one, it's actually picking up the specification. I think I'm, I'm hoping that will pick up really quick. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'd go back to OSV. I think, you know, it's a, an amazing tool that, it, you know, answers a very, you know, very simple question that I think a lot of people have, but it does it in a very elegant way. Um, and I'd love to see more use of it. Mine is, uh, we have a, a repo called uh, Creatively Enough Security Reports um, <laughs> that it attempts to be an archive of all the third party code reviews that have been conducted on open source projects. If I have that right, David, I might have that wrong. Okay. Um, uh, I, I mean, the goal of trying to understand who's been actually looked at by third parties and is there a consistency to the reports? Is it worth trying to create a, you know, a Wikipedia style kind of archive of this information? Uh, I, I think it'd be a great set of, of, of uh, knowledge to have in one place when I'm going out and looking at what software to use. So um, anyways, I, I'd, I'd love to see some more, more investment in that. Um, <coughs> okay, with that, why don't we open it up to some questions? It looked like Amanda, you had your hand up, so do you want to yell it out? Sure. Um, Go for it. So uh, Amanda's question was, uh, she saw her, uh, and she's from Open UK, by the way, uh, visiting us from uh, London, right, uh, I, it's, uh, where you called home. Um, I, I, how do we plan to work with other uh, regions of the world, let me extend it a little bit, uh, as well as other governments to do the same kind of thing we uh, did with the White House? And I'll, I'll jump in, but, but feel free to add, uh, add to it. Uh, so we are already an international project. We've got both corporate members from uh, Europe and from the Asia Pacific region, and we have control Contributors. Some of you traveled here uh, from Europe. Some of you traveled here from Australia. Uh, I don't believe, uh, and somebody traveled here from Japan, from Cy our friend from CyberTrust, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I, and uh, oh, great. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, we do tend to, though, have an unfortunate reliance, in my opinion, on 
uh, Zoom calls as the fundamental communications buffer or a bus. Uh, for the community, which uh, has some great upsides. I've loved seeing all y'all's face on, on Zoom calls over the pandemic, but it does make it hard for those in time zones that aren't kind of US centric to, to participate. And so one of, my, uh, one of the things I'd like to see, and I, I don't wanna push this too hard because I want people to be productive and not haggled, uh, but I'd love to see us use email more or use other asynchronous collaboration tools as the, the, the most baseline level of uh, form for collaboration. I see our friend Caleb nodding his head vigorously over there. He's from Australia as well, where most of our calls happen at two in the morning. Um, so uh, I, I can see why he agrees. Um, uh, the second part of that question was working with other governments. So um, uh, as I mentioned, nothing in the mobilization plan or the meeting we had was US government specific. We simply wanted to make sure that our friends in government knew what we were doing and that opportunistically we could find ways to collaborate on one or more of the mobilization streams. Uh, we've had interest from uh, folks in Japan, from folks in Singapore. Uh, uh, we'd like to, uh, we're, we're working to figure out how to do something similar in the UK. Uh, the European Union has put a whole lot of priority on kind of open source software as a policy first uh, kind of thing, which is great to see. And that kind of convening, where you bring together folks from different parts of government, folks from local businesses, to talk about um, the, ch the, the, the challenges with, open, with securing the open source community, but also the opportunities, is a very repeatable kind of format. And I would hope that it would help us in the long term fill the gap between the 30 million in pledges we've raised and the 150 for the overall plan. Um, but even if all we do is go there and find new allies, um, it's worth me getting on a plane. So uh, no, no plan more specific than respond to all the emails uh, so far. Uh, but we, we've got a, a few meetings in flight that we'll be as public about as, we, as soon as we can. I'd like to add to that. So I'm the community manager for an open source project called Artilius. It's incubating at the Continuous Delivery Foundation. And we um, had requests from people uh, out of Australia and New Zealand to, um, to somehow incorporate them into the discussion. So what we ended up doing was uh, we have sort of a, an offshoot of our architecture meetings that we do specifically in their time zone. It does require some additional work, but boy, is it uh, beneficial. Uh, really, really is super beneficial. So if you're on an open source project, uh, I would say find a partner in that region and ha let them you know, take, a, take a project and run with it and kind of build their little offshoot of the open source project. It, it is a huge way to go. The other thing that we're doing to try to solve this is, I'm not a fan of Slack or um, Discord for, to, for tracking these kinds of conversations. So I've reached out to the uh, DevOps Institute. They have something called DevOps in the Wild, where it's a, actually a community uh, discussion boards. And we're asking if we can have an Ortelius discussion board out there so you actually have historical record. It's almost like a stack overflow for the Ortelius discussions. So those are some ways that we're trying to address the problem. I feel very old uh, suggesting we use email because I know all the kids want to do PRs by TikTok these days. But um, I, <laughs> what is there actually? IRC. Oh, I, okay, I see. <laughs> Usenet, <laughs> gopher. All right, uh, uh, but uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I think. And, and well, actually, a, another example of this that I forgot to mention. So one of the one of the regions that open source communities often have the hardest time trying to reach is China, because you have the time zone difference, the language difference, and the firewall differences that make using tools like GitHub and Slack and others just a non-starter. Um, so one thing that we've set up within the best practices working group, uh, and, and I've got a charter I'll be delivering uh, for this group uh, very soon, and some names specific, is a group that will be serve as a bridge between a development community inside of China, of Chinese developers, uh, focused on helping translate and eventually contribute back upstream to the guides and the other uh, work products of the best practices SIG, the best practices working group. And if that model works well, we see replicating it potentially for other countries wh where the language barrier can be substantial as well, like uh, Japan uh, or uh, 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 South Korea for time countries where time zones are issues, like India. Um, uh, Another great one, uh, for sure, the Middle East as well. Um, uh, and then potentially with other working groups as well. We didn't want to try to do, boil the ocean by doing an open SF wide one just yet. Um, but I think that's key, meeting them where they are so they can use the tools they're most comfortable with, WeChat, for example, and they've got their own Zoom equivalent and the like. So uh, I think that's key to, to, to reaching, reaching local audiences. Anything yeah, else folks want to add? To add, I think as Brand mentioned, 
all the work streams are actually works globally, right? There's nothing specific to US. Obviously, US executive order is helping to mobilize some of them, but projects are actually global level. I would like to see actually the regional leaders actually step up and maybe have the local chapters, and maybe you can have regional open SSF days in the future in yeah. Europe and APAC. Well, um, Arno was with me on, uh, Arno Leors from IBM was, was with me on Hyperledger where we build a network of over 100 different local meetup communities city by city around the world who would host regular kind of g gatherings and that kind of, you know, withered during the pandemic, but I think we're at the point now where those kinds of things are happening again. And whether it's us or us showing up at B-Sides events and, and, and other security community events already happening locally and face-to-face, -face, the point is kind of fan out and try to get more base uh, into what we do. Sure, sure, go ahead, Amanda. And, and we should be very careful not to duplicate the effort of what folks like Open UK and OWASP and our other friends are doing in that front. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. That'd be great. Um, I do think we have time for one more question. Uh, especially since we tend to give five paragraph essays to answer uh, answers. Brad, we have uh, a question there. Uh, in the back there? Yep, go for it. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in the role of Can I turn that back around and ask what we should be doing? Oh, but let me repeat the question, because I, I don't know. I, I, and I, you mentioned AI and building, building sophisticated models, so kudos on that. But uh, the, sorry, I'll repeat the question. The claim was in three to five years, most cybersecurity issues will be about automated systems versus automated systems. And we might lose the battle if we deal with it too much, as I'm, I'm extrapolating here, as a cultural you know, community, let's just go find all the bugs and fix them kind of thing. Instead, AI models become much more important. Uh, and uh, just new kinds of defenses, I assume. So, so uh, I'm th unless anyone else on I have thoughts on that. Thank you for asking the question. Um, and this, I brought this up in, D in DC. So recently I picked up a book on chaos engineering and I was fascinated by it because the point of chaos en engineering is outages matter. In our case, security breaches matter. So I feel like we can't code our way out of this problem. I really don't believe we can. we can. We can do a lot to shut down a lot of the, you know, penetration points, we'll just call them, but we, we can never be 100%. So I feel like what we should be doing as a community is really coming up with a FEMA response, right? How, does, how do you report a problem? Then what happens? What is the escalation? Is there a central organization that reports to everybody what's occurred? I'd love to find out when Jamie, when IBM found out about Log4j or whoever first discovered that, which I don't know, what did they do? I'm a developer, I found a bad problem, what do I do with it? I feel like that is where we really should be looking at creating a proper response because outages matter, security breaches matter, and that's, that's something that we should be laser focused on to solve the problem long after we, you know, Alpha Omega has scanned as much as it can, and after we've got S-bombs everywhere, we still have the potential of having a breach. And what do we do with it? Any other thoughts from the panel? I think you covered well. Yeah. Okay. And any thoughts from you on what you think we should, we could do in this space? <laughs> well, I think we have a volunteer to help uh, convene it, perhaps. I see hands up. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think Elva right. has a comment. Oh, is that, no, I think, I think all the hands were like volunteering to go help. So put together, uh, Ava's gonna help you put together a great proposal for the TAC, and, and uh, I think we have uh, working group number eight already in hand. <laughs> great, uh, cool, well with that, uh, I think, are we at time? Yes, two minutes. Uh, do, uh, anybody have a two minute question that we can give? Uh, I, any other questions? Okay. Ava, go ahead.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, when there's a fire, the FEMA gets involved and they have an escalation policy, right? We don't have that in open source security. We don't. Well, let me, let me suggest yeah. mapping out, like, what, is, what does CISA do? Uh, what, you know, in the event of like a future log for Jim, just looking for Alan, uh, 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 what, what uh, does ONC do? What, uh, what does the National Security Council do? As, as like the government side, but then also uh, what does CERT do, right? And, and, um, and in response to log for j you know, that was where there was, it was actually discovered by a Chinese developer working for Alibaba, followed, uh, appropriately reported it to the Apache developer community. They made a commit to a repo that mentioned a CVE number and then that triggered, there's a whole bunch of vendors out there who watch commits, yep. who went, oh, there's a CVE number in this commit. I uh, wonder what that's for. Uh, and then that, that led to it inadvertently getting out uh, too rapidly. I might be w way massively under, okay, um, thank you. Uh, uh, and and so, so there possibly, if we were to map it out, we could probably find a gap. And, and I think one of the gaps that we found really spoke to one of the mobilization plan points, which uh, it, uh, called for the establishment of the emergency response team, right? Uh, uh, which is modeled after other things that we've seen work, uh, it, but not uh, as open source focused as what we proposed. But even if we propose that, I know that's what you were responding to with a yeah. comment in DC, um, there might still be a need for somebody who is more FEMA-like um, yeah. uh, 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 to complement those efforts. Yeah, so. Somebody has to manage that incident. That's, that's the, the, the key there. And, and, and Crowe wanted to say something on so that point. the vulnerability disclosures working group has created a SIG, the OSS CERT SIG, which we will have our first meeting the first week of July. Anyone that is interested in scoping out and trying to contribute to solving this problem, everyone is invited. So if you're interested in this problem, uh, find Crow, find Tracy. Uh, uh, there's a meeting first part of first week of July, week of July. to focus on this uh, to uh, get that emergency response team set up. Uh, great. Well, I think with that, that's a great place to end on. I want to thank my panel. Thank you, Brian, for having Tracy, me here. Tracy, Rao, and Bob, thank you.